How are you doing? Oh my God, see I love this because you guys are representing for LA and people are, are watching this on the live stream all over the world. So one more time, how are you doing? We're gonna get along really, really well. As Chris said, I'm Carol Roth and I am so excited to be right here in LA to kick off Virgin Atlantic's Business is an Adventure series. I wanna to get to know you guys a little bit before we get into things. So first of all, just quick show of hands. How many of you are LA natives born and raised from LA? Oh, we get shouts too, I love you guys. Okay, how many of you have been here for at least five years but not native? Okay, not quite as shouty as the natives, but that's okay. How many of you haven't had enough caffeine today and have no idea where you are? I completely don't judge, so no worries there. Um, as I said, I'm really excited to be here. I have been working it, with businesses and entrepreneurs for more than 20 years. And as you look at me and going, wow, she looks so young. How is that possible? I mean, did she start when she was like seven? I feel that you guys are very generous. It's obviously not the case. I started when I was nine. So I have advised companies from an entrepreneur with an idea on the back of a napkin up to major multinationals on billions of dollars in transactions and in transformation initiatives. Kind of seen everything, been an entrepreneur in my own right, and I play myself on television amongst other things. So as I put this all together in an entrepreneurial bubble, I know firsthand about the process of patience, of reinvention, of perseverance, and really the rewards that makes business an adventure. So that talks, that, that takes us to Virgin Atlantic, who also believes that business is an adventure. And this year, the transatlantic airline is launching a mission to uncover how America's brightest business leaders make that adventure epic. So this event is the very first stop on the tour, and we have gathered some of LA's best and most brilliant business minds here together, which includes you guys, so you can cheer for that. And really we wanted to bring everyone together in one space to share the ideas and, and that is really a lot of the core of what being an entrepreneur is about and what makes business that adventure. One of the things that we're gonna be exploring today is the idea of why simple solutions cross borders which obviously seems like a very natural fit here in Los Angeles because you have had so many amazing but seemingly simple ideas go out and completely rock the world. And we have some of the founders who are responsible for many of those ideas here today and cannot wait to hear their insights and to share with you. Now before we move on, I wanna talk a little bit about why Virgin Atlantic is running this event. Um, first, LA being the very first stop on the tour has always been a very important market for Richard Branson's transatlantic airline. They started flying between LA and London more than 25 years ago. And just over the last year, they have, they've um, added a second daily service. They've started flying one of those really cool 787 Dreamliners on the route. And how many of you have checked out their very cool hip clubhouse at LAX? Anybody been there yet? Yeah, if you haven't, you've got to get there. Very, very swanky. So all these things are very good for business travelers, but the reason that Virgin Atlantic is actually very focused on the LA region is because they see the growth in business travel here directly as a result from an increasing number of entrepreneurs, startups, and leaders who are sparking new ideas and businesses. So they want to help support the community's growth, and that means not just enabling travel on a global basis, but also enabling the sharing of ideas globally. So again, that's why they brought all of you wonderful, brilliant, like-minded folks here together, and we're going to celebrate how LA's entrepreneurial scene is soaring. Now, we couldn't do this event without the help of some partners, 
and Virgin Atlantic has tapped a few organizations that are playing a big role in fostering the growth of the LA entrepreneurial scene to make this event happen. So I wanna just take a quick minute to recognize those. First is General Assembly. How many of you have ever taken a class through General Assembly? Any, any folks out there? Super cool, if you're not familiar with General Assembly, they are a global education company that are empowering a global community to pursue work they love, I love that. And that includes thousands of adults right here in LA who have attended events, taken courses, taken workshops, classes, in all different disciplines. So data, design, technology, and business. And they've done that through one of General Assembly's three LA locations. Second up, we have WeWork. Any folks here working at WeWork? WeWork members? Awesome. Well, WeWork has almost 60 locations around the world already, and they are dedicated to helping people work to make a life, not just a living. Through their newest Los Angeles location, the Gas Tower Building, WeWork really serves as a local resource for LA's community of creators looking to pursue their life's work. So a big round of applause for WeWork. And I also want to give special thanks to Entrepreneur for their support leading up to today. And if you have any friends who may be at home who haven't jumped on the live stream, send them a text, send them an email. They can jump on the live stream right now at entrepreneur.com and watch what you're watching from the comfort of their home or office. Now, how many of you are social sharers, like to tweet out important things that are being shared, Instagram, anything, social sharers? Yeah. All right, so if you are a social sharer or if you have a question for our panel, we're gonna be taking a lot of questions through Twitter. So make sure you use the handle at Virgin Atlantic and the hashtag let it fly LA. And again, we're gonna be picking some of those questions from Twitter at the end. So at Virgin Atlantic and let it fly LA. Now would be the point when I introduce our guest of honor the mayor of LA, Eric Garcetti. However, unfortunately, he had a little emergency today. He had to attend to the recent developments of a gas leak cap in Porter Ranch, which I feel like is a very valid excuse. But if you know Mayor Garcetti, he is such a huge proponent of entrepreneurs. He's really created LA as a destination for people who want to start businesses. So he didn't just say, you know, good luck, you know, hope, hope, hope that you have a great event. He actually sent over a statement that I want to share with you. And so I will now be playing the part of Mayor Eric Garcetti. I am sorry I could not be here today, but I want to thank Sir Richard Branson and Virgin Atlantic for convening a collection of such dynamic people. You all represent the business leaders, entrepreneurs, and the leading thinkers of tomorrow. Los Angeles is an incubator of great ideas. I cannot think of a better place for visionaries to the likes of Sir Richard Branson, whose vision has crossed borders and eras. Many visionaries like him have demonstrated that it is simple ideas that change the world. And as mayor, I have focused on fostering the entrepreneurial climate here in Los Angeles. And we have seen the fruits of that thanks to the creative talent and leaders assembling in this city. Thank you. So thank you, Mayor Garcetti. He was such a huge supporter of this event. So sad that he couldn't be here with us, but love that statement from him. All right, so now we're getting ready to kick things off, and I am going to introduce somebody who I believe probably needs no introduction, but to be proper, we will do it anyway, and that is Sir Richard Branson. As you well know, he is the founder of Virgin Atlantic and the Virgin Group. And for those of you who may be um, confused by the hundreds of businesses that he has his hands on, Virgin is a leading international investment group and it's one of the world's most recognized and respected, as well in my, as in my opinion, fun and irreverent brands. <laughs> Conceived in 1970. <laughs> I still have more nice things to say about you, Richard. We no, were saying. Right. 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 <laughs> Just so you know, they have gone on to grow simple <laughs> ideas, 
In, in every, in, come it, come right. sit by me. I, I swear I won't bite. I swear I won't bite. Sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, but Hi, really everybody. in every other. Everybody good? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. This is an Thanks. amazing crowd. Thanks isn't for it? coming. <laughs> it's an amazing crowd we have here with us today. You know, Richard, you're obviously a very busy person, so appreciate you taking time out of your schedule, but I want to understand, you know, why personally are you passionate about doing an event series like this? And tell us a little bit about why LA is your first stop. Um, actually, it's a, um, I hate to say it, but it's our second stop. We did Detroit. Um, uh, <laughs> but, um, they, um, uh, but they don't, they don't and, count, and, because and, this is no, LA, no, sorry, and no. LA is first. No, we, we, did, we did Detroit because Detroit uh, needs, needs entrepreneurs. It needs rebuilding. Um, it's a great... Um, they, they, um, it's, um, uh, and they are beginning to get back on their feet again, which is, which is wonderful. And it was even, even better that the mayor of Detroit, when, when, when we were there, said, um, you know, could you talk to uh, the, the powers that be in Washington and try to, you know, we're, 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 we'd love to have all these immigrants um, from uh, Syria come to Detroit. We can re we've got all these empty houses. Let's, let's, you know, let's give them a decent, a decent life here and re rebuild it. So, um, but um, uh, I've been, you know, I've been an entrepreneur for 50 years, since I was 15, and, um, and uh, I've loved every minute of it. Not every minute, but pretty well every minute. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, and I think it's high time that, um, that I and other successful entrepreneurs shared, um, you know, shared uh, some, you know, shared thoughts and ideas and as, as to how we got here. And, um, and then hopefully it'll be useful for one or two people who are building their businesses or thinking of going into business. Just, just one or two people find uh, use in yeah. that. Well, we'll see. <laughs> I want to talk about the, the business as an adventure theme. When we think about the words business and adventure, your name's got to pop into just about everybody's heads. What does that mean to you personally and to Virgin Atlantic as a brand? Um, well... I mean, first of all, I think it's a mistake to think of business as a business. Um, I mean, the, the business is not about uh, dollars and cents. Uh, it's about um, creating something really special that's going to um, make a wonderful, positive difference to other people's lives. And, that, and that's really what a business is. And it's, it's a great adventure to, um, to, to make a, a, a big difference to other people's lives, to create something that you and the team around you can be really proud of. And, uh, and you know, that wonderful feedback you get uh, when, you've, when you've achieved that, uh, you know, makes you glow all over. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it gives you the incentive then to move on and create something else. Um, and I've been lucky that we've had a lifetime of generally, generally positive feedback, and which has spurred me on to do, to do, um, to do new things. So when I think about entrepreneurs and adventure, certainly entrepreneurs have to embrace adventure somewhat or they're not going to be entrepreneurs. But I think a lot of them get stuck with fear and with doubt. So can you share some of the times that maybe you had some fear and doubt along the way, as well as maybe some best practices that if you're an entrepreneur who's facing that fear, how you can put that aside to seize the business adventure? Well, if you start really young, you've got nothing to lose. So one advantage of quitting school at 15, I hope there are no <laughs> parents here. Uh, um, one, of the, one of the advantages of leaving school at 15 or 16 is you, ha you haven't got a mortgage, you haven't got a partner, you haven't got children. Uh, so it doesn't actually matter if you fall flat on your face. Um, it, it gets more difficult once you've been to college and you've you know, done your business course um, and maybe you've got your first mortgage. and um, maybe you've got your first partner and you're thinking of having children. Um, you know, then, it, then, then, it, then it becomes a trickier decision. Um, and, it, it, and it takes a lot more bravery than, than to, uh, to give it a go. You know, I would still recommend giving it a go. I think the fun of trying is enormous. Uh, what you'll learn from trying is enormous. Um, uh, and then if you're lucky enough to succeed, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's obviously, you know, very, very satisfying. If you don't succeed, um, 
you know, hopefully you're now not, not out on the street after this bit of advice. Um, <laughs> um, but, um, you know, but, but, you know, try to, try, try to start again. And, you know, if you haven't got the resources to do it yourself, um, you know, there, there are now, you know, so many different, uh, you know, like, it, um, I mean, internet sites and, you know, there's, there, there are so many people out there with cash that will in, invest in a really good ideas. Um, that you, you, if you've got a good enough idea, you should be able to find somebody to help fund you. Have you ever had any fear or doubt, the hundreds of businesses you've started, anything that's made you pause for even just a moment? Uh, I mean, obviously last year when we had the, um, uh, the space accident, um, you know, that gave us 24 hours of, um, of soul searching and, um, and um, and it was only after, you know, meeting all our engineers, meeting, um, meeting the families, um, uh, talking to our uh, ast astronauts in waiting, seeing that everybody wanted us to continue, that we, we decided to push, push, push ahead. And delighted to say that tomorrow, uh, my one-year-old granddaughter, Eva Dea, is going to be Instead of throwing a champagne, she's going to be showing, throwing a milk bottle <laughs> onto, onto the spaceship. Um, and we've got the new spaceship being, cool. being, um, yeah, being unveiled tomorrow. So, yeah. And I, I think you make an important, an important point that any entrepreneur can take away because you went to a community of supporters to get past that fear and doubt. So whether it's other entrepreneurs or someone in their company, that's something that, that anyone in the audience or anyone who's listening can, could do as well. Yeah, I think, I think um, the um, time that, um, you know, by, by having a, you know, you know if, yeah, I'm sorry, the, the phrase family with companies gets used too often by a lot of companies that where, where working in that particular company is anything but a family. Um, so um, I would hope that everybody in this room who's running companies is running their, their, their company like a family. Um, and if you're running it like a family, you can um, enjoy the good times together, but when, when things are really uh, you know, tough, you can all rally around and help 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 the family get through it um, and um, and you know we're, we're lucky at Virgin you know we really do feel um, feel like a family and and if thing if if if, this, if somebody's having a tough time uh, everybody rallies around I want to move to the concept of simple gotta, we've got two people standing outside there do you think we shouldn't invite them in we'll, we'll get we'll, we'll get them in yeah, this, one second much I promise, out there, I, prom yeah. I, promise. <laughs> I'm promise, trying, everybody. I promise we'll bring them in in one moment to add to the conversation. But one more question for you, just about your philosophy of being customer-centric. When I think about Virgin, a lot of your ideas were to take maybe something that existed, create a challenger brand, but something that was very focused on the customer, something that really met their needs in a different way. Can you talk a little bit about that philosophy? Yeah, well, since Virgin Atlantic have been good enough to pay the bills today, I'll, I'll use Virgin Atlantic as the example. Um, they, they um, see, I do my bit, you know. Um, um, so, um, yeah, so, um, you know, we started with literally one secondhand 747 30 years ago. Um, in those days, you were lucky if you had a, um, a lump of cold chicken dumped in your lap. That, um, there was no entertainment. Uh, the cabin crew... Uh, didn't smile, um, uh, and uh, and it, it was it, you just felt like cattle going from A to B, and um, and that's why you know that, I just thought screw this we can we can make this a much more fun experience, um, and um, yeah I remember distinctly ringing up the head of Boeing and saying um, hello my name's Richard Branson um, do you have any secondhand 747s for sale. Um, <laughs> I'm and, sure they um, get those calls every day. <laughs> and I, and I, I was, I was uh, what was it, 27, 28 years old, and they said, well, well, what do you do? And I said, oh, well, I have a company called Virgin. Uh, we, you know, we've got the Sex Pistols, we've got the Rolling Stones. <laughs> and, um, uh, and there was a long pause, but, but they, di they didn't actually put the phone down on me, and, and they were good enough to, I, I mean, their, um, their final line of the, of the call was, um, yeah, Richard, you know, you may want. You may. Maybe you should change the name of the airline because with a name like Virgin, we, we won't. Nobody will know whether it's going to go the whole way. <laughs> anyway, um, so, yeah. um, <laughs> so, um, so, 
yeah. We're, we're glad that you stood strong in that yeah. advice. Yeah. 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 So, um, um, but I think, um, yeah. So you, if you're going to create, if you're going to create an airline that's competing with airlines that are, you know, like we were taking on British Airways, 300 planes. We had one plane. We were taking on Pan Am with 250 planes, TWA with 300 planes, um, Air Florida with 200 planes. And it's amazing, you're still here today, and, and many of those companies aren't. And, uh, yeah, 19, 19 <laughs> of the 20 of, uh, who we competed with disappeared, and that, and that just goes down to you know, give, give people what they want um, in your uh, quality-wise, and people will come back again and again and again. All right, so you want to bring some additional people in this I, conversation? I, I, I think we should. All right, so let's bring out the rest of the panel. Please help me welcome to the stage Cassie Ho, the founder of Blogilates, Miguel McKelvey, the co-founder of WeWork, and Sean Rad, the founder and CEO of Tinder. Come on out here, guys. Virgin Red. Right? Virgin Red, yes. <laughs> I dress with you then. <laughs> and let me just uh, give each one of these entrepreneurs a proper introduction. Cassie Ho, who is the founder of Blogilates, is an award-winning fitness instructor, an entrepreneur, and an online personality. And she is the creator of Blogilates, which is the number one female fitness channel on YouTube with, get this, over 300 million video views and 2.8 million subscribers. Such an inspiration, thank Cassie. You. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. <laughs> I know that you will all want to swipe right on Sean Rad, who is the founder and CEO of Tinder, the world's leading social app for meeting new people. And we think about a global reach. Tinder is connecting people in all 196 countries and is a top 10 lifestyle app in more than 70 countries. So Sean, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And then of course, last but not least, we have Miguel McKelvey, who is the co-founder of WeWork. And he's also his chief creative officer. And he directs all of the architecture and design and construction activities, and has been involved in the early stage development of many, many startups. So a lot of good perspectives to add. So Miguel, welcome. Yeah. All right, so I want to take this conversation micro to start and talk a little bit about the nature of the LA entrepreneurial culture. And you know, some of what maybe the rest of the world can learn from the entrepreneurs in LA. So Cassie, I'm gonna kick things off with right. you. Uh, we're talking about how simple ideas really can take off and everyone on this panel is a great example of that. How do you think your brand took off to be this global sensation on a global le level from something that was just an idea? What's, what's some of your secret behind that? You know, it all has to come from a place where you want to help people and genuinely want to do that. So back in 2009, when I put up my first YouTube video, I was teaching to a class of maybe 40 people at 24 Hour Fitness in like Whittier, California. I was moving to my first job in Boston, so all my students were like, Cassie, I'm gonna miss you. What are we gonna do? So I said, all right, well, I'll shoot a little video. I'll put it up on YouTube, and you can do that when you miss me. And I didn't realize it at the time, but so many other people were gonna be watching the YouTube video, and it was a way to make fitness free and accessible without any equipment you could do it at home, and that's kind of how Blogilates started, just from my wanting to teach people. And is there anything about LA in particular and what you've learned being part of this community that you think helped inspire you along the way? Being in LA is really special for a YouTube creator. There, I think it's like become a hub for uh, YouTube people. Anytime you want to collaborate, you just text your friend and be like, hey, we'll be in this video with me. And then like they will come and then you collaborate and it's like so easy. And um, when you make these genuine relationships, then you can promote each other on each other's channels and it becomes very organic because I only like to uh, collaborate with people who are actually my friends, people who have a common vision and who like to work hard and also people who aren't just trying to get famous and rich. I mean, the, it, it'll happen, but you have to have a different- Not that there's anything not, wrong there's with that. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not original right. intention. It's, and so uh, I, I've created this really nice group of people in LA that we collaborate with all the time, and it's been fun. That's fantastic. Yeah. And Sean, when I think of that global reach, you know, Tinder being a top 10 lifestyle app in more than 70 countries, you've really taken something from you know, this local market and exploded it around the globe. What do you think your secret is? 
Well, I think what, what's special about LA <clears throat> is the diversity that you have here. So we're not, we're not living in, in, in a, in, the, when you walk out of the office, the tender office, you walk down the street, you sort of get this diverse uh, sense of, of people from different backgrounds, from different professions, and it, it makes you feel closer to who you're building these products for. Um, and for any consumer tech company, um, the closer you are to the user, for any company, the closer you are to the customer, the better you understand them, the more empathy you have, the, the better decisions you're going to make, and the better job you're going to do innovating forward for them. So I think what's special um, about LA is both the people that, that work at the companies in LA come from such a diverse background, um, and then the people you're socializing with out of work also give you that diverse perspective. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, it, Cassie mentioned the, the YouTubers, you mentioned innovation. Miguel, when you think about creativity in innovation, you have people in your WeWork spaces who are really exemplifying that. What do you think is special about LA in terms of the capacity for LA entrepreneurs to be creative and to innovate? I think a lot of what we see is, you know, aspiration. The cool thing about LA is that so many people have come here to follow their dream. And I think maybe in the past that was more related to entertainment, but now it's diversified in so many ways. And so, like Sean said, you're finding people who are perhaps inspired by the history and of like coming here to chase their dream, but now they're doing a huge variety of things. So when we did our first building, we were like, you know, a little bit outsiders were like, we gotta be in Hollywood because that's where like movies are made and all the creative <laughs> will be there. But like the reality is, is that people all over the city are creative and are pursuing their passion, you know, in so many different uh, ways. So that's been really cool to see that happen in, you know, here in downtown LA, in Santa Monica, in Hollywood, you know, it's everywhere. So one of the things that entrepreneurs are always in need of is resources, whether it's resources for support, whether it's resources for investment. Do you have any favorite secret resources that are available in LA that you want to share with the audience, Cassie? Special resources? Yeah, any resources. So, you know, whether it's, um, you know, a, a place that you like to go to, to meet with other entrepreneurs, other organizations. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, the YouTube Space LA is actually a really cool place to start. Tinder's not bad. T Tinder, I haven't <laughs> been there. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah, YouTube Space LA, they, they let you, if you are a creator with over a certain amount of subscribers, you can go there and like rent a red cam for free. You can shoot on a green screen. Um, that's a really cool free resource for creators. And then a lot of YouTubers now have well, I mean, I we just built out our own studio, so we invite YouTubers over. We do collaborations there, so that I don't have to be filming uh, just at home or in an apartment or something. So we all share our homes with each other. That's, That's amazing. Like a filming resource. Miguel, obviously, WeWork is a great hub, but any other resources for support or even investment in LA that you want to share? Well, I think for us, we're still you know a place where hopefully those connections happen. Like. We're definitely trying to create a platform where everyone is sort of coming together. And I think as we evolve, I think that's a need that is growing here, like places where people that gather together, because it is disparate. Like there are, you know, a lot of places divided uh, amongst neighborhoods. And so I think creating more places where people are coming together and that entrepreneurial energy is really, you know, coalescing in one place is um, definitely necessary. So we hope to be a part of that. Great. I want to switch up the conversation a little bit and talk about building global reputations in businesses. Richard, obviously, this is directly in your wheelhouse. You've done this uh, maybe a couple hundred times. So can you talk about some of your highlights and maybe even some of your challenges along the way in terms of building that global brand and, and business? Well, I think, I, I think first of all, if, if you have an idea you know, like a Tinder, like we, any, any of the ideas on stage and, uh, and, um, and most companies, um, uh, you, you shouldn't just think of, you know, if you live in Great Britain, you shouldn't just think of Great Britain. If you live in America, you shouldn't just think of Great Britain, of America. You should think of the world as one country. Um, and, uh, and, and it's a lot more you know, it's a lot more fun to think of the world as one country because it means that, um, you know, when we started our record company many years ago, um, you know, we, instead of licensing our product to other people, we set up our own record companies in France and Germany and Japan and, um, and Australia and so on. And, um, and, you know, when we had the hits, we, we, we you know, the, the profit margin was much bigger and, um, and, you know, having built up the brand 
in these countries, then we would start get signing local French artists or local German artists, and um, and um, and we became over the over the years a brand a brand to be reckoned with. Um, so I think the, the 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 key thing is to try to come up with a brand for your company that uh, can work internationally. Um, I mean. Saudi Arabia, for instance, uh, has just launched um, Virgin Mobile. We thought we'd never be able to break, <laughs> break, break into Saudi Arabia with, with our brand. But anyway, um, so, so, it, so, so it's, um, uh, but um, yeah, but, um, but, think, but think, definitely think global, which a lot of, a lot of people don't, don't do. And um, I mean, for instance, um, you know, I was talking to J Jamie Smirnoff from Ring Earlier, who's another a very good company in LA, um, and you know he's built built a formidable company in America, um, but people are beginning to copy him overseas, and you know I think it's it's important, and uh, you know I know it's difficult because you're you're so busy building your business, um, but it's important for him to find the time to find somebody to go and uh, you know get get Ring going in in other countries around the world because it's you know when you've got a formula like that. Um, you know, you, you want to t turn it global. Sean, obviously, you know, you're in so many different countries. What advice do you have for entrepreneurs who are attempting to expand into global markets? You, you know, we have, we have users all over the world, and, and we're now starting to open offices um, in different parts of the world so we can, again, get closer to the, to the, to the users. But um, what, I've, what I've noticed is that your culture dilutes with distance. And if you don't have a strong home base and a strong culture and way of doing things, um, then you're gonna, you're, you know, over overseas it will dilute to almost nothing. So I think my, my, my biggest advice and one thing we're going through is, before we expand the team um, beyond our our sort of headquarters, we we're we're making sure that that we have a strong understanding of who we are, what our goals are. Um, and that we know how to translate that. We know how to translate it within our own roof, but we know how to translate it across, across borders. Um, nowadays, millenn millennials are very focused on not just what they're doing, but why they're doing it. What is the purpose behind what they're doing? And if you can't explain on a global level um, to your workforce why their job is important and why it's impacting the world, then you're gonna fail. And I think companies need to evolve to do a better job of that and doing that on a global scale is even even more challenging. It's already challenging doing it in one place. <laughs> right. But, but so, doing, I, I just, I'm gonna have yeah. to tell, tell my Tinder story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 yes, we, have, we all want to hear this um, one for sure. And by the way, this is this is the 40th anniversary of me being married to, this year. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so, so um, um, right. but, no. So the the um, uh, yeah, just to show to show how far Tinder reaches. So. Um, so we, we live on a little island in the Caribbean. Um, uh, it's uh, 72 acres, and, um, uh, and these people booked the island, they all arrived, and there was one single girl who arrived on the island. Um, and, uh, and her first night there, um, she decided to get onto Tinder and send out a help. Um, I'm, 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 a, I'm a single girl, I'm in the Caribbean. Is there, is there anyone out there? Um, and, um, I didn't know they were distressed uh, <laughs> calls, but I need to know. And, and, um, uh, and um, she gets this response, um, oh, I'm in the Caribbean. Um, and um, so she goes back and says, well, actually, um, uh, I'm, I'm, um, I'm on a tiny little island, and I'm about to have um, sushi from a canoe in a, in a pool. And uh, the response was, oh, well, I'm the chef who's about to give you some shit. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. and, and they ended up getting together. And, and I, think there's, I think there's still, still an item. Wow. <laughs> so, and that, and that, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, that, and that chef bringing the sushi, that wasn't an innuendo. That's actually what happened, was, right? Okay. Was, uh, just just making, just, clar just clarifying <laughs> that. He was, he was the actual chef. Similar anecdote, there's, there's two... Um, 
scientists in Antarctica. I think there's like 30 <laughs> people living in Antarctica who met on Tinder. And they're also together. True story. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. So what you who's, think? Who's, who's, who's met on Tinder in this room? Anybody? Anything. Oh, yeah, look, I've seen a few little hands. <laughs> There's There's hands. hands. Yeah. They're putting them up quickly and then putting them down again. <laughs> <laughs> we, won't, we won't say who you are, but I've just counted 50 hands. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go my, my mum's there. Mum, you should go on to Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back, Sean, to what you were saying about the culture and starting culture very strongly in your home base before bringing it internationally. Any thoughts about bringing people from your home base to start internationally? Because obviously you want to, you want to transport that culture, Absolutely. but you want to also honor the culture of wherever it is you're going. Absolutely. Um, I, we encourage the team to travel. Um, I think, I didn't believe in sort of um, going to the countries. I, I think you, when you start out as a small little startup, you sort of think that you can capture the essence of every country from just being where you are, especially now that um, information is so accessible. Um, but myself, uh, even two years ago, we did, you know, I, I, I traveled um, to a few countries throughout Europe, and I was just shocked at how when you talk to people how Tinder has a different definition um, based on the society, people's backgrounds. And, and in order for us to grow the company, we need to understand how people look at the product so we know how to make it better for every constituent there is. So I think we encourage, um, whether it's the product team, the marketing team, the growth team, to go visit um, different countries and set up focus groups and understand our users. And likewise, our team around the world, we bring them to LA all the time. Um, and and we, we get to know them and we immerse them into the culture because um, I think you want your team, number one, again, to understand why what they're doing is so important um, to the world, to them, but also, like, we underestimate, especially nowadays, like, just the value of being physically in a room together, right? You can't, like, the phone, I, whatever, you can't translate physical interaction um, and there's just nothing like enjoying an experience together. That's like the Tinder motto, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> new, new, oh, new. you guys caught on to that. Good. I'm very quick, so you have to keep up with me up here. All right, so Miguel, I want to talk about advice for getting started because you have started moving into international locations, globalizing your business. How important do you think it is when you're first starting out to be thinking about being global one day from day one? I think for us, I mean, my partner is uh, Israeli, and you know, I'm from Oregon, and we met in New York. And Oregon, in some ways, is a more exotic place to New Yorkers than Israel is. Um, <laughs> but, um, but we both had that perspective that like we're coming from far away, and so I think we, from the beginning, felt like we were we were gonna reach out, and we were, and it's not just you know other places in the United States, but certainly um, internationally, we had that idea from the beginning. And so I think we always had the perspective that we had like a massive problem to solve. And so it really like created a context in which it allowed us to um, really think big from the beginning. So rather than like sort of um, realizing, well, wow, this problem is really big today, it really put a much bigger context that like, look, we're gonna try to be an international company and very quickly. And so therefore um, it allowed us to always be like, what's like the best solution to this problem? Not like what's like, what will get us halfway there, but we're gonna need to do this in Israel yeah. next year, so we gotta do it right. And I think that's a good context. Um, the other part is I think you, know, you gotta be really confident in what you're doing. If you're not confident you know, in LA or in New York, you can't imagine that it's gonna work in London or Tel Aviv or Amsterdam, so you gotta be super committed and really believe in it, and then it will translate you know, that confidence. Yeah, and, and Cassia, I want to bring you into this conversation because you and I were talking offline, and when you put that first YouTube video up in 2009, you had no idea that you were going to get 300 million views and 2.8 million subscribers. So for someone like you who maybe started without that global perspective, mm -hmm. how do you harness that once you realize that that's something that's pretty important to your business? I've always listened to my community, my fans, I call them popsters, as guidance for what's next. And 
they were the ones who first said, hey, we really like this. Can we have a butt video? Can we have an arm video? And so every couple months I would release something. And then when it started getting serious and I was able to quit my job, um, then they started asking for clothing. And I said, all right, I'm going to try designing some clothing. And then that became my own activewear brand. And the great thing is that it's that immediate feedback with social media. So you can really test things super fast. And if it doesn't work, you just retract and you try again. And um, I think that coming from a place where I didn't know where Blogilates was going to be, you've just got to trust yourself, trust your community, and give them what they want. Because they're the ones who, who basically gave me what I have today. So I always am grateful um, for this community, and I'm always there to serve them. So I think as long as I keep doing that, then the right things will happen. And I'm just going to tie that together because you know that's exactly what Richard was saying before. If you serve that customer, if you do right by the customer, mm. then they're going to be there for you. Absolutely. All right, so let's move on to talk about what the future of global business might look like. And Richard, you've been doing this for quite some time. You've, I'm sure, seen the pace of change accelerate in the last few years as technology has become democratized. So if you had a crystal ball, how do you think global business will change over the next few years? Um, how do I think it will change? I think. Um, um, as I've got older, I would love it if um, more and more of the institutional money could be invested in um, in business, uh, but business that uh, is making a, you know a really positive difference in the world. So um, you know, so we, we've got to get to carbon neutral by 2050 as a globe. Um, uh, it needs um, it needs enormous amounts of money for us to get there, and and. You know, it'd be wonderful if we can power the world with, with the sun and with wind and so on. Um, uh, you know, in, in Africa, um, uh, there's 600 million people who don't have uh, any energy. Um, uh, they, you know, companies uh, are starting and need to start um, to give them energy and make sure it's clean energy. Um, they, uh, so, um, so, uh, you know, so I think you know what I'd love to see over the next 20 or 30 years is um, the the rate of people being pulled out of poverty on a global basis being um, at least as fast as it is today, um, and and it you know it, it is good, um, and I think for for all of us, where we, if we've got spare cash to invest in ventures uh, which will con contribute to that. So um, I mean, just one other thing that we're actually doing, which is we're putting an array of satellites around the Earth um, so that the four billion people who don't have internet or Wi-Fi access can, can be connected. And, um, and you know, if you, if you don't have internet access, you can't get your website. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, you're going to be the poorer for it, and where, whereas those people who do have internet access are likely to be the, be the, the people who, who, who are the wealthier. So you're seeing a lot more um, purpose that then ultimately drives profit, but maybe it's leading with the purpose. Yeah, I think, I mean, look, most businesses have a um, purpose in themselves. Um, uh, but, you know, if you've got a choice of, um, you know, a business to make money in the Maldives that's run by a wicked dictator or um, business to make money in... Um, Ghana, which is not run by a wicked dictator, you know, choose Ghana. I mean, just so, so, so it's just, it's just, you know, just all, all the time, just looking at the different, you know, looking at the different options. And if you're going to spend your time, um, a lot of your life r running something, try, try to make sure uh, that you can, you're really, really, really proud of what, what you're doing. Um, and, but I also think we, you know, those of us who've got some influence over the institutions need to try to get them you know, to, instead of investing in the, you know, coal-fired power stations, uh, which is a dying industry, um, you know, persuade them to invest in um, the, a new clean, in, clean in industry. Well said. Um, Sean, I want to go over to you and talk about technology in the future, because obviously you're very entrenched in technology in the here and now, but how do you think that technology will evolve and really help entrepreneurs to thrive in a global landscape? Well, I think, first of all, we have to realize that there's like the next billions that are coming to, the, to sort, of, sort of coming into the global context with, with underdeveloped markets, getting internet access and everything. So you have to think about your businesses um, 
you know, not just reaching developed markets, but, but once that next wave of internet users come in, um, or connected users come in, I think the possibilities of, of the scale at which we're gonna operate and deliver these services and the possibility, it's gonna open up new possibilities because there's a new audience. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, I think the, the, good question, where is technology going to go? It's a tough one. There's, I think one of the things that are going to help um, a global landscape uh, connect is, I, I hope, that the laws and systems by which we communicate as businesses are gonna be standardized across the globe. Because the products that we're offering cross borders, um, but, but, you know, yet, but we still have different systems, different laws and different borders, which does make it harder as a company to expand your operations globally. Um, so I think, doesn't really answer your question as far as the technical landscape, but I think from, from a business and legal standpoint, scaling those businesses requires um, a more standardized global approach than standardized country level approach. Yeah. Cassie, from your perspective, you know, other than perhaps some of the legal issues, is there anything that you think that can be done to make global markets more accessible to an entrepreneur like yourself? Free public Wi-Fi for everybody. I think that would help. Um, yes, fast too. Sounds like Richard's got you covered <laughs> yeah. on that one. <laughs> um, and I think for me that that makes it accessible to everyone because a lot of you know YouTubers their videos are free. So if you have access to free information, then if you use those videos to then meet people in real life, you know do the workouts together or something, then that's gonna. It, the more we can take online and bring it back into reality, like that's when like really cool things start to happen. So if, as you look into the future, do you see that, you know, now that we've all gone online, that there will be some coming back in the other it direction? To. It has to be. Like, uh, Blog Lobby started online on YouTube, but then just last year we signed a deal with 24 Hour Fitness to bring my Pop Pilates classes into a live setting so that people can actually take the classes. And that's really cool for me because there's only so much you can do in your bedroom watching a video. Your form is probably wrong and you're like very secluded. But when you're in a classroom, you're getting motivated, you're making new friends, and that's going to actually change your life. So yes, for sure, it's gonna go online, it's gonna come back, and it's gonna cycle through, but nothing beats uh, re real people. Online, real people. offline, Sean, yeah. this is well, all I think, you. Well, I think, I think, I think the, the, the online world and the offline world are converging, right? You even, mm. you even think about Tinder, and it's, and it's a product that really empowers you to live, the phys to live, make the most out of your physical world, and I think, um, the, the two, the platforms are gonna blur, blur, especially as we get, um, as artificial intelligence sort of, and, and natural language um, interfaces become more of a thing, I think technology is going to sort of be integrated into everything in the physical world. Right now, it's still very separate. It's something that exists in our pockets, but I think the, the, the two worlds are gonna collide and blur. Um, and then as, as more people have access to those technologies and information, the audiences are gonna widen, um, and I think that's, that's pretty much, I think that's going to change everything. The we, interface in which we interact with technology is going to massively change in the next five to 10 years. The other part of that which I think is important is like other systems need to adapt as well, whether it's tax system, whether it's like business licensing, like there's still so yep. many hassles. For someone who wants to take their future in their own hand and be an entrepreneur, there's still like a whole bunch of bullshit you have to deal with yep. that distracts you from what you're actually passionate about. And so I think over time, certainly in other countries, it's gotta be even harder, but I think the more power that we put in the hand of the creative person who actually has that passion and wants to do something, and then we don't put a bunch of barriers in front of them and that hold them back, you know? So if we can do that, and we set an example, especially here, that can be rolled out in other places, you add that to technology, it's gonna be a whole different picture. Yeah, we actually, we actually <laughs> surveyed people, um, entrepreneurs, and we found that they were spending up to 40% of their time on non-revenue producing activities. That is not what entrepreneurs should be doing, so we need to take back that power as entrepreneurs for yeah, sure. Definitely. I was just going to say that, I mean, I mean, if Miguel is frustrated by the tax system or by a lot of these other systems, <laughs> I mean, every one of those is a fantastic business opportunity for somebody in the yeah. crowd, because uh, anything that frustrates you, um, you know, you, you, just, you just need to be able to cre cre create a way of uh, creating something to get rid of that frustration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it's great that there are, as you say, still 40% of things out there frustrating you, which means there's still 
tons of opportunities for new budding entrepreneurs. That's true. <laughs> so, Richard, I think you're going to end up with business plans from about 50 people in the <laughs> audience for that exact thing after this. <laughs> Miguel, I want to go back to you and talk about um, just in terms of expanding globally in the future. You have a very different perspective. You have all these people who are collaborating. You're enabling mobility. Do you see any trends around mobile workforces or perhaps that you think are going to really rapidly change in the next few years globally? Well, the one thing I think we find is that people are sharing the same mentality and so therefore it's easy for them to connect. So there's a lot of simple stories where we have members who have just you know, been on vacation and they pop into a WeWork location and all of a sudden they have a group of people that they're like totally aligned with. They feel excited to connect to each other because they're all uh, in the same sphere of pursuing something, pursuing something passionately. So, I think that being able to connect in real life and knowing sort of how to navigate the, the, the foreign place is really a crucial part to having the courage to go there, right? If you know you have a group of friends in Tokyo, you're gonna go to Tokyo, not whatever, you know, Seoul. So I think those kind of things, like feeling like you're in a connected network is super empowering. You feel safer, you feel more comfortable, and therefore you can take bigger, more, you, know, you have more courage, and I think that's crucial. And I would just like to point out that the entrepreneurs are going on their vacations and popping into a WeWork location <laughs> to do work because that's what entrepreneurs do. Yeah. All right, before we move on to chatting with some of the startups that we have here, I would love for you all to just give us one quick take on why starting as an entrepreneur in LA or doing business in, in LA um, really provides that supportive platform and the network for businesses to develop into a global success. So why don't we start with you, Miguel? To me, the great thing about LA is that there's no <coughs> shortage of inspiration. I think when you're in this place, you can look in pretty much any, any direction and see a great story or a great example of someone who followed their passion and you know, achieved a great result. And I think that's what many people are looking for. And probably when they leave the city that they came from, it's because those examples aren't there. So when you're in LA, if you're not paying attention, if you're not consuming all of those stories, you're really missing something. And to me, that's what's inspiring and what certainly will never go away. That will be true to LA forever, which is awesome. That's great. Sean? Yeah, we, we talked about this before. I think it's just a diversity and, and diversity of those stories. I, I, when I look back at Tinder, um, we would not be here were it not for a team that was diverse both in, in, in their background but also in their professional background. And it was kind of the decisions we made was a consequence of people having a very unique take on the problems. Um, it's some, you know, sometimes being naive is, the, is like the best tool you have to go out there and solve something because you don't know what's possible and what's not. Um, and in that sense, having a broader perspective that LA brings you allows you to solve problems within your own industry. All right, Cassie. Uh, like Miguel said, lots of inspiration, lots of great stories here, meaning there's lots of people that you can connect with to collaborate with. But at the same time, I also think that though LA has a ton of resources, you can pretty much do whatever you want anywhere that you want now because of the internet and social media. So I don't think it really limits anyone to start their own business or become an entrepreneur. You just gotta figure it out if you want it bad enough. And Richard, you've been doing business here for a long time. Anything special about LA in terms of facilitating right. those global global success stories? Let me think. What's special about <laughs> LA? <laughs> <laughs> um, very important to be well connected. <laughs> Virgin Australia can take you to Sydney. Virgin Atlantic can take you to London. And Virgin America can take you all over America. And it all based from here in LA. No, anyway. Um, um, <laughs> it's so seamless the way he works that into the conversation. I love it. Um, they, I, I don't know. I've, I've, I've just loved, we, we used to have a re our record company was based in LA. Um, and... Um, uh, and we discovered lots of fantastic artists here in LA. Janet Jackson we signed many years ago, um, and she got very pissed off when we signed Paula Abdul, who, who was her choreographer, um, and uh, Lenny Kravitz, and anyway, just lots of great, lots of um, fab fabulous musicians come, come, come out of LA, so if you're in the music business or in the entertainment world, it's definitely the place to be. 
Excellent. All right. Well, I've enjoyed the detailed conversation that we've had, and it's time for us to take all the deep expertise we have here and pay it forward to a few very exciting LA-based businesses. So if you don't mind, I'm going to stand up now and invite to the stage the very first of these businesses, Kavan Canavan, co-founder and CEO of Focus Motion. Please join me on stage. And while he is coming here, Focus Motion, you can find at focusmotion.io. It is a machine learning software company dedicated to improving human motion analysis and quantification through wearable and body sensing devices. How did I do with that? That's, that's perfect, yeah. All right, so the way that this is going to work okay. is take a minute or two to explain your business okay. to the panel and to the audience, okay. and then we'll facilitate a couple of your burning questions with these great experts. Okay. All right, fantastic. take it away. Um, just like she said, uh, my name is Kevin Cannon. Our company's name is Focus Motion. And what we're doing is we're designing the next generation of algorithms that understand wearable movement from body sensing devices. Uh, what most of you have probably had in the past is something like a Fitbit or the Nike Fuel Band or maybe the Virgin Pulse Max. And those are great devices, but all that they do right now is track steps. And we think that there is so much more to human movement than just tracking steps. And there's so much more and so many more markets that are out there besides consumer step tracking. So what my company does is we take the beautiful waveforms coming off of these devices and we basically teach an algorithm what these waveforms represent. So we can move into markets and tell you exactly what happens when you're doing a push-up, when you're doing a bicep curl, and we're even seeing movement into physical therapy, workforce monitoring, factory monitoring, Pilates potentially. Uh, and we just have a fantastic group. We got into this uh, really with my co-founder and I because we believe in the, the power of dark data. So sensors really enable new types of development and new ecosystems to happen. And with this new data, you just need to be able to interpret it and use it. And right now, no one's really interpreting it except for steps. And we're going to grow and broaden that entire market. Excellent. All right. So that's a lot of data to take in right there. What's the, the first question that you would love to get answered by our panel? Um, I, I guess it's, it's the typical risk question. Uh, one is, what is the risk that you took that paid off? And then. The ones that we don't usually hear as entrepreneurs are kind of the dark days questions as far as what was a risk that you took that didn't pay off? What? Yes, I like her. All right, I'm going right to Sean on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, can you share the, uh, the highlights and the lowlights? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think what I would say is, is um, as, as you're probably experiencing, like you, you, this has to be something that's bigger than yourself if you're going to hang in there because it gets gruesome, it gets hard. Um, I know many times I've kind of looked in the mirror and said, "Why the hell am I doing this?" Like, wh you know, this is torturous at times. Um, but but if you can't answer that question and, and say that 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 you believe in something, you're doing this because you're solving this very important problem to you and to others, then you're just going to like quit. Um, and it, it does it does get hard. I mean, I have I can't think of one story. There's there's been hundreds of lowlights. I feel like every day I wake up and there's you know there's there's both special moments and there's dark moments. And the thing that kind of gets you through it is just to be very focused on what your goal is, um, what you're trying to accomplish, and kind of really prioritize um, what matters and what are what are the sort of the eighty the the, the few things that are going to get you eighty percent of the way there, yeah. and just ignore the rest. Mm -hmm. Miguel. Uh, well, um, I can say one of the biggest risks, risks that we took was um, deciding to do the construction of our first building without having enough money to pay for it. Um, <laughs> and, and we had an investor who was awesome and amazing, and he committed to support us in uh, completing that building, and unfortunately he wasn't able to, to uh, fully support us. And so there was a moment where the money in the bank was dwindling quickly, and we didn't know what the answer was going to be, but we just knew that what we were doing was really uh, something special. We felt like we'd hit on something. And so similar to what Sean said, we were so committed, we just knew at some moment that person will come along who believes in us and will support us. And it literally came down to like the last second. And um, I mean, this is a building, I still have like PTSD when I walk by it because <laughs> it was so intense, that feeling that it could all sort of collapse. And um, luckily it didn't, and, and, and it, but it was only through faith. You know, it was just like that sureness that it's gonna work out. Richard, anything to say about managing risk when you're an entrepreneur? Um, 
Well, I think well, I mean, we've had a few failures over the years. Um, uh, when, when I was in my early 20s, um, a lot of my friends were getting married, so we thought, let's go into the bridal business. Um, <laughs> they, virgin um, brides? <laughs> <laughs> Vir vir virgin, virgin Brides is what, it, is what it was called, and we just uh, found that we had no customers whatsoever. So. <laughs> there. Um, right, that's it. <laughs> really, what more is there to say? All right, let's move on to the next question that you have. Yeah, um, so we're dealing with a lot of new data, right? And we think that we're going to have a huge impact on healthcare and the way that people look at their bodies and the way they recover from injuries, the way that they they move and they train themselves in the same way that they age. Uh, this, this might be outside your purview, but I think it actually is inside of all of them. How do you guys view the future of, of healthcare and where things are headed from maybe a global scale and potentially a national scale as well? Cassie, you're right in health yeah. and fitness. I mean, fitness is about preventing having to go to the doctor mm -hmm. and take pills and medicine. Um, it's all about preventative medicine. So the more that we can use your data to get stronger, get fitter, faster, um, then we can really use that to deal with the childhood obesity and all that kind of stuff. Like we need to look at that data and help not only just America, but the whole world to figure out what the problem is. And yes, it has a lot to do with lack of movement, but it has a lot to do with our nutrition as well. So the more data that we can get uh, to solve that equation, I mean, you're doing something really good for the world. And Richard, you're in the health and wellness business as well. Um, yeah, we are, and I think what you're doing uh, is, is, is fantastic, because if you can, if you can um, you know, get a product that works, um, uh, you know, we, uh, our company would definitely want to talk to you about using it, as I'm sure a lot of other companies would. Mm. I mean, we, 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 um, uh, we um, uh, came up with this idea in South Africa um, where um, if people get, went to the health clubs, um, they would be able to get um, free insurance uh, from an insurance company, and the insurance company ended up actually paying you know, I mean, effectively paying for the health club membership. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we have hundreds of thousands of people paid for the insurance company uh, to go to the health clubs. Um, uh, and it's a win-win for everybody. Um, you know, the people are healthier. Um, they, they, they have sort of free membership for the health clubs. And so we also, we brought that to America and Virgin Pulse is based in Boston and we work with uh, companies in trying to keep their employees fit. And, um, and they have you know, the Virgin Pulse wristband on, on their wrist. And, and, you know, if they do a certain amount of exercise a day, um, instead of having air miles, you know, we, we, we've got health miles for them. And, and, um, but anyway, we'd love to, love to talk, to find out Me more too. about it. I'd love to. That's yeah. great. And I would just say that the quantifiable self is obviously something that's really, really hot. And I think the fact that people want to know data about themselves and use that like Cassie had said to get better. So the more data that you can provide, I think that's gonna go hand in hand with healthcare for many years to come. Can I geek out for a second? You can geek, geek out for a second. Yeah, so, so what we really have seen is quantified self, right? We've seen this counting that's happened over the past probably 10 years since Nike Plus first came out. And what we're thinking we're going to see over the next few years is something called understood self, where you start to see who am I and like what am I doing specifically during the day. And then we think we're going to see something called quantum health. And that's the idea that you're going to be able to see millions of views that have already existed before you because the data is going to exist ahead of you. So when you go and you talk to a doctor or physical therapist, it won't be a generalized treatment. It'll be what's specific for you. So yeah. That, that is the future we all want to see. Come on, thank you so thank you. much for your time. Appreciate it. And make sure you check out Focus Motion at focusmotion.io. All right, so next up we have Joanna McFarland, who is the co-founder and CEO of Hop Skip Drive. Help welcome her to the stage. Hopskipdrive.com. And if you have kids, you're gonna to wanna to know about this because Hop Skip Drive is the safe and reliable ride share solution for parents who need to get their kids where they need to go when they are not able to do so themselves. So Joanna, same rules to you. Introduce the company a little bit to the audience and to the panel, and then we'll facilitate some questions. Excellent, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm Joanna McFarlane, and I am the co-founder and CEO of Hop Skip Drive. Hop Skip Drive is a ride service for kids. We help families get kids where they need to go safely and reliably when their parents can't by matching families with highly vetted and highly curated care drivers. And we call them care drivers because they're caregivers first and driver second. So our, our care drivers have a minimum of five years of childcare experience. 
their moms, their teachers, their nannies, they're used to working with kids. And they go through a very rigorous 15-point certification process to become a care driver. So we are the first rideshare company, we're very proud to be the first rideshare company that fingerprints our drivers because of the cargo we carry. We put them through background <laughs> checks. Thank you. We, put the, we do driving record checks, we do reference checks, we meet every driver in person. We do far more than most people do when they're vetting a nanny or a babysitter. And we think about safety before the ride, during the ride, and, and behind the scenes. And Hop, Skip, Drive came from the three of us that founded the business, Carolyn, Janelle, and myself. We have eight kids between us. They go to six different schools. They participate in pretty much every child activity you can imagine. If there's an activity for kids out there, one of our eight kids is doing it. And quite frankly, we just couldn't manage it, and we couldn't figure out how to get them there. And so we created Hop, Skip, Drive to solve our own very real problem, and in doing that, we found that we were solving problem for thousands of families across Los Angeles. We've, we launched a little over a year ago. We're operating all throughout Los Angeles. Uh, we just closed our Series A and are ready to take Hop, Skip, Drive to millions yeah. of families across the U.S. Congratulations, very exciting milestone. So what questions do you have for our panel of esteemed experts? Yes. So, you know, Sean, you mentioned earlier um, culture dilution, and I thought that was really interesting. You were talking about it as you move into international markets. You know, I think it's something that we're really thinking about as you go from kind of four employees to 10 to 20 to 30 to 100 to, you know, we're not at 100 yet, but, um, you know, those first employees are so passionate about the mission and what they're doing, and, and as you grow, how do you avoid that cultural dilution, and, and what are your hiring strategies to maintain that culture as you get bigger? Sure. I think, I think the, the most, it starts with having a clear understanding of what is the problem you're solving, who's the customer, what is the vision of the company, and constantly communicating that. Like, even... Even today, like, you know, in my own head, I'm, I feel like a broken record. Like, I keep saying, you know, repeating, why are we here? Why are we doing this? But you can't say it enough. Um, so I think it starts with that. The other thing is culture is how you act because others are going to take away those behaviors and they're really looking up to, um, to not only their peers but to the people that they work for. So I think... Um, one thing I realize is you have to be mindful of, you know, as, as the CEO is running it, like, what is the message you're giving across in your actions and how are you treating the people you work with? Because that's how they're going to treat the next person who's going to treat the next person. Um, and then also, you know, um, I would say documenting, not over-documenting, because you also don't want to alienate people. If you, like, we, at Tinder, we don't have... Uh, words on the walls that say this is our culture because I think that's cheesy and I think a lot of people um, feel like, you know they look at that and they're like wait but that that's not me I'm far more dynamic than that I'm not gonna be reduced down to three sentences or whatever but documenting in the sense that there are things that you guys do how you make decisions how you run meetings um, what you you know how what is the agenda of an all hand that if you read in between the lines because you're prioritizing those things really speaks about your culture. So I think there's certain things to document and widely distribute, um, and there are certain things to not. And then I think, but it really all comes down to how you behave and what you do that really defines the culture. And let's ask Richard as well. I mean, you have hundreds of companies where you've been able to maintain such a vibrant culture. Any thoughts about how a startup can harness the same kind of thing that you thought about from the start? Um, well, first of all, I just love, love the idea of your company, um, and I'm already sort of, my mind's Great. racing on to think of, you know, how you could move it on to the next, uh, the next phase, um, you know, um, so, um, so the, you know, uh, so you, if you've got, na if you've got uh, nurses as part of your driving drivers, you know, maybe they could also be nannies at, at night, so you could have a nanny service. As as well, uh, maybe you're. Are you doing nanny services yet? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've always want to run before I can walk, so that's so, so excuse me. But but um, but uh, um, anyway, it's a, it's a it's a tremendous it's, it's a really it's a really great idea, and I think with with yeah with nannies, if you can have the, these the kinds of people that you've vetted here, um, you know, the, the, it sounds like most of them would be great to be na na nannies as well. Um, so they might, you, they can, they can, they can drive them somewhere, then they can uh, do the nanny later on. Um, 
The anyway, how do you, how do you? Um, I mean, I think it, it, again, you, it, it, it so much depends on the person who's running a company. I mean, if it's a small company, um, I mean, obviously you you sound like a delightful individual uh, in, in a few seconds. Will <laughs> really you get to know me? Um, they, they, um, and um, and I think it, a lot of it stems from you know from the person who's running the company, their 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 approach to people, how how kind they are, how, how much they genuinely care about the, the people who work for them. Um, and, uh, and you have the advantage that you're also doing something uh, with a real, a real purpose, which will make a big difference to people's lives. Um, so, um, so it shouldn't be, I think, too difficult for you to um, have a very a re really good motivated workforce. Um, I think, you know, as, as the boss of the company, you shouldn't be frightened of going and getting drunk with, the, with your people, letting your hair down, having some fun with them. Um, uh, Where do you get to know me? <laughs> <laughs> but make, make sure you have a notebook in your pocket because all the, all the things they'll tell you at the bar, um, you, won't, you won't remember them the next morning unless you write them down. <laughs> we have time for one more quick question. Okay, sure. So a lot of you talked about moving market to market and you know, I know you have a well-defined playbook and you use that playbook. Every market's different and you talked a lot, I think, about you know, your Hollywood, you're coming here and thinking that Hollywood was the right place and really finding that everything is all over L.A. Um, as you've grown market to market, does it get easier, or is the 50th market just as hard as the second market? And, and you know, what are what are some of the things that you've learned along the way? Well, uh, just in going through that process of entering new markets, first of all, you said we have a well-defined playbook, and I would love if you know where that is. I would, <laughs> I would love to have it because um, I haven't seen it. But I, I think Richard's <laughs> scribbling in it over there. <laughs> Um, be, because that's one of the toughest things. It's like you wish, but the reality is, is that it's not necessarily that Chicago is different than, you know, Nashville. Is that you've changed in the meantime? Like you figured out so much stuff that your playbook is out of date by the time you get there. And so you think it's like, oh yeah, we're going to solve the problem, and then we'll transfer that knowledge to the next place. But you've completely transformed as a company in the meantime, so you have to figure it all out over again. Let alone you probably hired like 18 new people in the meantime, and they all have to be trained and figure out you know, it all for themselves. So it doesn't get easier, um, but, it gets, <laughs> but it gets to be better every time. So it's not easier, but the results are better. You know? And that's a, you know, a good uh, encouragement to do it again and again, because you know you're improving rather than you know, going downhill. Great. Have you have you launched in any more than one market yet? We're in all of LA, um, okay. which is the geographic equivalent of six cities. But we are. <laughs> we are have you have you considered? I mean, I love the brand as well, the name. I mean, have you considered franchising uh, in, in another city, or do you want to do it yourselves? We we've talked about franchising. I think that trust is such a core component of what we do, and, and goes to the authenticity of the brand so much that you give up a lot of that when you right. franchise. So we're we're planning on doing it ourselves, and, and we'll be in our next market very very soon. Yeah. All right. Well, so we look luck. forward to seeing you yeah. in many many markets. Again, congrats on your milestone, Joanna you. McFarland from Hop Skip yeah. Drive. And I would just say for any of you in the audience who have kids ages six and up, you can use my promo code, which is Joanna, and you can get a free ride for your first ride here in LA. Always be selling. I love it. <laughs> Good job, Joanna. And we have our final startup that we'd love to come to the stage, and that is Dr. Renee Dua and Nick Desai, the co-founders of Heal, which you can find at Get Heal. H-E-A-L dot com, and they are the pioneer in the on-demand primary health care services industry, providing patients with affordable access to world-class physician, physicians in the comfort of their own home or office. So welcome to the stage, guys, and same rules to you. Explain to the, uh, the audience and the panel, and we'll facilitate some questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, and I just want to start by saying thank you to Sean and Cassie and Miguel and uh, especially uh, Mr. Branson for taking the time and giving us the opportunity to be up here. Uh, Nick, we're husband and wife, and uh, Richard said a few minutes ago about if there's a pain point in your life, create a business to solve it. There was. We had twin boys, and one of them was sicker than the other one, and we had to get them to the doctor's office every week, and it was a huge pain because we had brand new twin boys. So we created a service where the doctor's office comes to us. Uh, Heal is a simple on-demand app uh, that you can use, and a doctor will come to you 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., seven days a week. Uh, and when we started the company, 
for people, it's, it's fairly obvious. No one here likes going to the doctor's office, right? Is there anyone who actually likes that experience? So <laughs> it's not hard to convince consumers to use this product. But the questions we got asked all the time, well, why would doctors do this? How will you ever make money doing this? This can't work. Doctors see 40 patients a day in their office, but they're only going to see 12 or 15 patients a day driving around. This business fundamentally can't work, right? And the reality is that by making doctors, enabling doctors to see less patients and provide higher quality care, not only do you make the doctor's life better, but you improve health outcomes, and by extension, not only save companies and insurance companies and individuals money on their health care, but help them lead better lives. And we, from day one, we have zigged where others have zagged. People said, well, if you're going to do this service, we won a contest last March, and we won a $100,000 prize, which was great, and all five judges said, raise your prices, and we said no. And they said, you'll never get into network with insurance companies. Insurance will never pay for this. They won't say you can use this home same copay to have a doctor come to your house as going to a doctor's office. Well, today, we're in network with all the PPO providers in California. And they do pay for here. Thank you. People said, take one market at a time. Well, we didn't. We went, we're in all over California, and we see hundreds of patients a day throughout the state now. And ex by extension, we have corporate clients like Google and Qualcomm and Activision Blizzard and other companies who promote Heal to their employees as a great lifestyle benefit, but also as a way to control healthcare costs and improve health outcomes. But fundamentally, for anyone in the audience who gets sick, and I think all of us will get sick at some point, or has children who get sick, and wants to see a doctor the next time you need a doctor, instead of going to an office, urgent care, ER, use our app, book a visit, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., seven days a week, a doctor will be at your door within two hours. And we take your insurance, and otherwise the cash pay price is only $99. That's Heal. Excellent, Amazing. excellent, well said. Very interesting business model. What questions do you have for our panel? Uh, I have, we have two questions. The first is, and all of you have done this, is fundamentally change the industries you're in. Right? What WeWork means, what Tinder did for dating, what you've done in the fitness world, and obviously what the Virgin brands have done, is we're trying to change an industry, not only where sometimes disruption comes along where people aren't expecting it, right? Tinder came along and it was like this, wow, it came out of nowhere and it changed an industry that people already thought was, well, there's ways to date online, right? But we're going up against forces in healthcare where people are fundamentally betting against us. There are articles saying why Uber for healthcare will never work. Right? And I, I admire the courage it takes to do that, and especially, Mr. Branson, you've done that with airlines, you've done that with the music industry, and so many other places, right? I flew up to San Francisco yesterday on Virgin America, and flew back today to make it to this thing um, on a different airline, and the experience is fundamentally different, right? How do you build a successful business when the entrenched forces don't want you to succeed? Um. <laughs> Well, I, I, I sympathize because, you know, we, 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 we've been, uh, yeah, we've been through it. And, and in the early days of building a business, it's particularly difficult because the press, are, uh, they know that they, they, they're apt to side with the big guys because the big guys are going to be around right. and, and they're not sure that the little guys are going to survive. And, and the big guys are always giving them their stories. So, I'm sorry, but, uh, you know, we, 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 we found that when we were up against British Airways many years ago. Um, and um, and in the end, you know, you 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 you. you I mean, with with our battle with with British Airways, where they went to extraordinary lengths to put us out of business. Um, you know, we, we we you know we managed we did manage to um, expose them. We took them to court. Um, uh, we won a celebrated court case against them. Um, and um, and you know and anyway, somehow you know I think that because the product the quality was better. Um, we came out. We came out okay. Um, they, can I just ask you one question? And I, I sort of just put my. Uh, um, we, 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 we invested quite early on in a company called Doctors on Demand, which yeah. I think um, sounds quite similar to what you're doing. Um, it, uh, I mean, there's, I, I suspect there's room for, you know, quite a few companies in this right. area, and, and it's, a, it's, it's obviously a sector which I'm 100% believe in. Um, right. Uh, what would be the difference between what you're doing, say, and Doctors on Demand, and, um, and do you overlap at all, or do you compete at all, or how many other people like that are competing with you? 
Well, that's a, thank you for asking. Doctors on Demand is a great company. We know Adam Jackson, their CEO, very well. Um, Doctors on Demand is telemedicine. It lets you interact with a real doctor, but over a video or a phone call. And that's a very valuable service. And if you're late at night or far away, or you need someone to just say, hey, do, do I need to go to the emergency room? It's f fundamentally a very important service. And we don't consider ourselves co really in the competitive space because we want to be your primary care doctor. And they want to augment the gaps in care because doc you can't rush a doctor to your house every day. When you have a little baby, when we first had a little baby, believe me, I would have had a doctor living with us. And my wife actually is a doctor, but not a pediatrician. So I already had a doctor living with us, and I would have had a second one. But fundamentally, they are a great company that if you're farther away, if you live in a geographically undesirable area for certain types of questions, and especially if you manage chronic conditions and have routine questions for a physician or want a second opinion, it's a phenomenal way to get that. We can be your doctor. We can be the primary point of interaction from healthcare in your life. And that's, that's the fundamental difference in our business. And I would say we have a very, uh, very aligned view with them and Adam on the healthcare space and the need to get people out of the trappings, both doctors and patients, of the clinic and the, and the hospital environments. Great. No, it sounds like it's, um, yeah, they're both very, very different, very different yeah. and both very, very important valid yes. organizations. Uh, and you have a second question as well. Yeah, the can second I, question. Can I answer that Sorry. One real quick. I, I think, you know, I've had this analogy or talked about this analogy before, um, and it's kind of extreme, but I think it's important in this case is that, you know, if you were like accused of murder and you didn't do it, you would fight forever right. until you exonerated yourself, right. right? Like you'd never give up. Right. And I think when you're in an industry where you feel like, it needs to be changed so bad. You have right. to have that same attitude. Like right. if you're never gonna give up, you don't care about entrenched people or whatever because right. it's so core that right. you could give a shit about all of right. them. You're just gonna keep fighting it nonstop right. forever until you win. And therefore, you don't even think about that. You that's, just do it. That's a phenomenal answer. Yeah, I, I, I mean, also, if you, if, you, if, you, if, it's, if it's that bad, I mean, you know, we, we in the end got an investigative journalist from Granada Television to come and do a documentary, two documentaries right. on, mm. on what was happening to us. Um, if you've got, you know, if you record, right. you record conversations, you right. know, I mean, you know, uh, uh, I mean, get an under, you know, get a, get, get a, maybe a friend, just right. go under, underground with a camera. Right. <laughs> and, 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 well, whatever, whatever it takes, you know, but right. just expose what's going on. Right. Har harness I, the power of media and social, for sure. I, all right, very quickly, last question. The second question I have, and again, this applies to all of you equally, is you've all be built products that are more than some of the parts. Flying Virgin's about a lifestyle. The, the fitness products you offer, Tinder has fundamentally, being on Tinder or not on Tinder is a choice people make that represents something about them. And WeWork is more than just a co-working space, right? How do you build a brand that becomes more than the sum of the features of the product you offer? Cassie? It's about the community. And like I said before, it's the people that make up your business. And as long as you keep serving them right. and giving them what they want, then that's what people are buying into. Like when somebody buys a shirt from me, like yes, it's a great quality product, it looks beautiful, we just spend a lot of time designing it and testing it, but they also want to be part of your story and part of that journey. So I think that's what that is. I think, I think the answer to both of your questions are the same, which is if you're doing something exceptional <clears throat> and you're telling your story to your users, they're gonna fight with you. Right. So, you know, Tinder's no stranger to crazy amount of press on both right. extremes. But at the end of the day, like we've just gotten very good about ignoring it and focusing on our users because for every article that might get under your skin, <clears throat> there's hundreds of thousands of right. users that are screaming to the top of their lungs saying that this changed their lives. Right. And I think um, you have that clarity of, of vision and what you're trying to solve. And as long as you keep talking about that and fight and say it, right. um, I think you're gonna have the answer to both right. of your questions. Excellent. Great um, product. Sounds like you're on your way. So congratulations. Yeah, and thank you so much Great. for being here. Thank, thank you so much. Nick Desai and Dr. Renee Dua from Heal. All right, so I know you guys have been busy tweeting in questions. We have time to take just a couple of questions from Twitter, which if you've ever been on Twitter before, you know could be really, really interesting. So 
Let's get our questions. I could only imagine what these might say, especially some of the things that you said, Richard. I don't know. All right, so this one, Richard, is, is directly asked to you. What was the riskiest bet that yielded what you see as your best reward? Microphone. Um, oh, I just tell a fun story. I was, <laughs> I was, I was, I was. Um, my, my kids reached the age of um, 18, and I decided uh, to take them to a casino um, and uh, and give them $500 each in order to, to to show them not to go in, not to go to casinos in the future. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and, and and you know, if they want to try to earn enough money to own one, that's fine. But then they don't must never ever play in a casino. So. So we go in, and, um, uh, and we quite quickly, uh, each of us lose our $500. Um, and Smug Dad goes to the bar with them and gives them a little pep talk about, um, you know, th this is why you, you mustn't go to casinos and so on. <laughs> and after about half an hour, we've had a few drinks, we're just leaving, leaving the casino. And the table we, we, we'd been on, uh, they, they, everybody stands up, with, gives us a round of applause. And there's this is massive pile of chips on the table. And we'd left a chip which, is, which had doubled and doubled and doubled in, the, in that <laughs> half an hour. <laughs> and um, anyway, so I had to wipe, wipe my forehead. I handed all the money out to everybody on the table and, and, and quickly took the kids out and said, you know, that was the exception to the rule. <laughs> <laughs> all right, the next question is, why did you become an entrepreneur? And Miguel, I'd like to start with you on that one. Hmm. I don't, I don't know if there's a why. I think it's just sort of inherent in who I, I always was in the sense that for some reason when I saw problems from the time I was a kid, I wanted to solve them. And not necessarily in business, but just generally, like if I was unsatisfied, I wanted to work hard to find a solution. I couldn't just go by and look at something and not think about how could that be better. And that seems to be, um, it's never left me, it's always been there, no matter where, what I've been doing. Sean, what about you? Um, I think, first of all, entrepreneurship is not a job, right? It's, it's a, it is, it is a reaction to you wanting to solve a problem. So I think for me it was, <clears throat> I just, there was, there was a problem I wanted to solve for myself. Um, you know, whether it was with this company or the last company, and um, and I guess that labeled me as an entrepreneur, but but you have to wake up and say that I'm passionate about making a change, and I am passionate about pulling together people and resources and aligning them against that change. Um, not wake up and say, I want to be an entrepreneur. Because I think, I think the, the, you, you'll kind of be lost in this, you'll, 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 be, you'll be looking for a problem instead of, finding a problem looking for a solution. So I think you have to be careful with that. Very well said. <coughs> yes, I want to ask you the next question because you seem like a very balanced person. Mm -hmm. So how does an entrepreneur manage work-life balance with the demand of a new venture? And you know, especially with things like fitness and eating yeah. well, what, what is your secret? You have to put your health first. You, because people, people who work out or take care of how their body feels, it also helps make you more motivated throughout your business as well. And I think that's really, really important. So I like to wake up, um, whether I'm working out first thing in the morning or later in the day, I schedule it in my phone. Like it is like a date and I do not miss it because it's important to me. And it's not just about your physical vanity. It's not about, you know, looking a little bit more tone. It's about how it makes you feel. And honestly, fitness makes me feel really happy. And when I don't work out, I, I'm just not that same type of a person. So you've got to make fitness a priority. At the same time, um, you know, figure out what, what can you sacrifice. Sometimes you do have to sacrifice things when your business is growing really fast. I mean, that's just the truth of it. Until you find that balance and then you can have a little bit of everything again. But always focus on, on your health and, um, and your family and make sure that you're surrounding yourself with people who make you feel good and who support you. I'm um, not even asking yeah. Sean this question because he hasn't <laughs> taken a vacation in years, and I'm forcing him to put it on his calendar. Richard, um, can, how I, can, 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 <laughs> I, can I just say, yeah. I mean, I 100% agree with everything you say. 
Um, and, and then I think in order to uh, in order to get healthy, try to find something you enjoy doing. Oh, 100%. Um, yes. So, yes, yes. you know, if, if, if you like kite surfing, you know, go kite surfing. If you like, you know, I mean, just try to find, you know, bike, bike, bicycling, whatever it takes. Um, but, but do try to find half an hour at least a day uh, for your body. And so, you, so then your mind, you, you'll end up doing two or three hours more c constructive um, stuff if you, if you do that. And, and what, what you said about uh, it's finding the joy in fitness is that is exactly what it is about because you should be able to wake up in the morning and look forward to this thing because if a lot of people look at working out as like a chore as something that they don't want to do that they dread and that's the problem if you've got to find something that you like maybe it's dancing kayaking doesn't matter find that thing and do it and make it part of your lifestyle all right and I this last question I'm gonna go down the line to all of you how do you spark creativity in moments where you need an inspiration? Miguel? Well, I'm lucky to live in a place that, to me, feels inspiring every day. Like, when I feel uh, overwhelmed or I can't f really figure out a way to focus or I can't find something, I just walk through New York. And I sometimes that's for 30 minutes. Sometimes it's for, like, three hours. And ev eventually, whatever thing is distracting me dissipates and then I find some kind of clarity, but it's really like both the body moving and also the surroundings you know, changing and all of that just is um, almost like a meditation and um, it just works for me. John, where do you get your creative spark? Um, I surround myself by people who are more creative than me and I overshare with them. Uh, I think through those conversations and sometimes friction comes creativity and you have to be transparent and be willing to put yourself out there and be vulnerable but um, um, I think it's about surrounding yourself with the right people and then not being afraid to just have deep and vulnerable conversations with them. Open yourself up. Cassie, yeah. what about you? I really like Pinterest actually um, for artistic things. I, I can just browse on there forever. And also if I'm having some type of a block, I can always ask my fans on you know, Twitter or Instagram, hey, what do you guys think of this or that? Um, but the other important thing is that you need to give yourself space because when you are just so overloaded with information, you just, you can't be creative. So just find quiet, go somewhere, and just let yourself think, like just, just go wild, and that's when I get my, my most creativity. What about you, Richard? Um, I think, um, I, I mean, I travel a lot. Um, I um, meet a lot of people. I listen a lot. Um, uh, I, I take notes, um, <laughs> which, which, um, which I can, you know, often can't understand sometimes when people are having a <laughs> meeting with me that they, you know, because uh, you know you're only going to be able to remember so much. But, um, but, you, you, but just by... By traveling, you, you just come across so many, you know, so many different people with so many different wonderful ideas. Um, and you know, if, you, if you're a good listener, um, you're going to all the time be coming up with ways of improving um, things you're doing already or, you know, or, or new ideas. I mean, unless you get hop, skip, drive up quickly, it's going to be uh, it's going to be in the UK next week. So hurry, hurry up! <laughs> Love that. <laughs> Love that. And uh, and a perfect a perfect place to conclude the panel portion. Before we wrap the event, um, first of all, I want to thank the panel for sharing so generously. Every one of you are extremely busy people, and for you to come here and to be so authentic and to share your learnings, your highs and lows with the audience, just such a, such a treat. So a huge round of applause for our panel, Sir Richard Branson, Cassie Ho, Sean Rad, and Miguel McKelvey. Oh. And you. And you. Thank you, Richard. That's gonna go down as a highlight for sure. And we also have some other thank yous. I want to thank the startups again for adding to the conversation because I think there's a lot of takeaways that anyone can learn from the kinds of things they're going through. So again, hop, skip, drive, focus, motion, heal. Thank you so much for adding to the conversation. And of course, our wonderful partners at General Assembly and WeWork and Entrepreneur, thank you for your support. Big round of applause. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank every single one of you, whether you're here, you're watching on the live stream, but thank you for taking the time 
to work on your business. I think that we get so caught up working on the day-to-day -day that sometimes we forget to take a step back, make connections, learn something new, get that strategy and that perspective that can help take your business to the next level. So give yourselves a round of applause. All right, so now we have a very highly interactive workshop. It's sometimes called the drinking workshop. Other people know it as the networking cocktail. And I really hope you'll take advantage. We've got about an hour, and we have so many great people here. We have entrepreneurs, we have business leaders, we have investors. So I hope you'll take that opportunity to connect. And there's also two cool new startups to check out in the lobby, two of LA's fastest growing. One is Soothe, which provides massage therapists on demand. Every entrepreneur, I'm sure, is going to want to see that. And Vintana, who creates these really cool holographic experiences. So you're for sure going to want to check them out. So on behalf of Virgin Atlantic and its partners, I'm Carol Roth. Thank you so much and hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. And they're gonna they're gonna get